back to DBX Labs. In today's video, we are going to continue our route to isocyanogen tetraazide, aka azetoazide azide, by making the precursor to the compound isocyanogen tetrabromide. The way that we are going to do this is by brominating sodium 55 azotetrazole, the energetic compound that we made in the last video. Now, before we start off the video, I just want to mention my Patreon. Chemistry is often a very expensive hobby to get into, and working with energetics generally costs even more because of the exotic nature of the chemicals required. Currently, all chemicals and equipment required for these videos come out of my own wallet, so if you want to help out the channel a bit, consider becoming a Patreon. Anything would help out a ton, as right now I'm limited to what I can budget towards chemistry each month. Patreons will also get exclusive benefits as those listed on my Patreon page. Now to get on with the video. The bromine that we prepared in the Making Bromine from Pool Chemicals video will be used to brominate the azotetrazole. However, it's actually not brominating the azotetrazole, it's breaking it apart, releasing these nitrogens and leaving behind this isocyanogen-based compound. The bromines will attach onto the isocyanogen in these four different spots. Once the azides replace our bromines, we will have our final product. So we know the reaction mechanism, but how are we actually going to do this in a lab environment? Well, first off, we're going to need a solvent that dissolves both bromine and sodium 55 azotetrazole so they can properly react. Just so happens that sodium 55 azotetrazole is very soluble in water. Bromine also somewhat dissolves in water, and we can increase the rate in which it dissolves by rapidly stirring the mixture. This reaction takes place anywhere between room temperature and 100 degrees Celsius, so we're going to set up a heating bath to maintain the temperature of the reaction. Now, at this point, I can predict that you guys have two basic questions. First, you're probably thinking it's pretty counterintuitive to break all the nitrogens out of an energetic compound because it's not going to be energetic if there's no nitrogens. That's correct, and it is very counterintuitive to do this because you wouldn't think you would have to go all along the means of making tetrazoles to make this C2N14, but that's just the way it is. You have to make the tetrazoles in order to make this isocyanogen chain that we have right here. And that's the chain that's going to allow us to throw the azides on later. The second question you probably have is how the fuck am I going to do this reaction using an Erlenmeyer? Because that's all I use, all my videos, I only use Erlenmeyers. And I really should stop, but I like Erlenmeyers too much, so I'm not stopping except for this reaction. This reaction I do have to use a round bottom flask. We want all of our bromine to sell at the bottom of the flask and get stirred rapidly by a stir bar. This obviously isn't going to work with just an Erlenmeyer, so that's another reason why we're using a heating bath to heat up this round bottom flask. Now if you remember from the last video, I'm not giving out the exact measurements. However, this is a 1 to 8 molar ratio of the sodium 55 azotetrazole to the bromine. This corresponds to roughly a 1 to 5 ratio of the azotetrazole to bromine by mass. Both of our stirring compounds, a highly soluble salt and a highly volatile liquid, should be easily discernible from our final product, which should be an oily brown liquid at the bottom. That's enough talking for now. Let's start off the synthesis. So here's our setup. I've got stacked condensers right here that are going to reflux our bromine while it's in solution. And I've got about 150 milliliters of water uh, along with a stir bar in the round bottom flask. At the start of the reaction, we'll be running at room temperature, and then as the reaction progresses, we'll move up the temperature until we reach around 100 degrees Celsius. Hopefully an umbrella will prevent UV from getting into the reaction mixture and destroying our final product. First off, I'm going to add an unspecified amount of bromine into the water through the top of our first condenser. Now I'm going to add a dissolved solution of an unspecified amount of sodium 55 azotetrazole in through the first condenser opening. I couldn't find an umbrella so I'm just using this piece of cardboard to block the UV from reaching our solution. The heating bath has been resting at a constant 100 degrees Celsius for about an hour now. We can see the evolution of nitrogen gas from our solution, which is an indicator that we are progressing the reaction along as the tetrazole rings are breaking down and leaving behind that isocyanogen chain. We can also see that the bromine is refluxing steadily. 
Okay guys, I'm back and we do have a product. It's been refluxing for about three and a half hours now and if you look underneath the stir bar there, we do have a black oily liquid that is denser than the bromine water and has settled at the bottom. I'm going to pipette that little bit out, add some more bromine and see if we can recover any more product. Here's our recovered isocyanogen tetrabromide. It looks heavily contaminated with bromine. That's why I threw in an ice cube. Hopefully the isocyanogen tetrabromide will crystallize out. And I can already see it sort of doing that. Uh, and that way we can separate it from the bromine, at least partially. As you can see at the bottom of the beaker, the mass of isocyanogen tetrabromide has solidified. Where bromine freezes at around 19 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 7 degrees Celsius, the isocyanogen tetrabromide freezes well before then. So where the water in here is liquid, so it's obviously above freezing, therefore above the 19 degrees Fahrenheit, we can see that the frozen mass is actually our isocyanogen tetrabromide rather than bromine. When heated from underneath, it decomposes without releasing bromine fumes, which is a sign that we do have our final product. I filtered the isobromide crystals from the bromine that was contaminating it, and I found that they have these yellowish color, and uh, it melts at right around 50 degrees Celsius. This melting point is a key indicator that I do in fact have the isobromide, and that tells us that we can move on with the next step of making isocyanogen tetraazide. With this amount of isobromide, we should be able to do a wide array of tests with isocyanogen tetraazide. If you guys liked this video and want to see more videos like it, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.